here's a very quick lesson in Roman history. Rome was traditionally founded in 753 BC by the first Roman king, Romulus. Who know what was named? Um, there are seven Roman kings until 509 BC when uh, a, led by a man named Brutus, uh, the Romans throw out the increasingly authoritarian and tyrannical kings. Uh, the last king was Tarquinius Superbus. Um, and the Roman Republic starts. So, shall we say, 31 BCE, the Roman Republic, or the Roman Race Publica. The, Roman, the, the public thing, the public state. Um, which when Rome was ruled by its senatorial class, uh, Rome was never a democracy in the sense that Athens in the fifth century was a radical democracy ruled by its citizens. Um, the Republic in ancient Rome was always uh, under the control of the Senate. Um, the Senate was um, more democratic, you could say, uh, than certainly the kings, the reges of Rome. Uh, the, for instance, in the Roman Senate, there are two consuls meant to be a check and balance on each other. The consuls uh, were elected every single year. Uh, we can very, very roughly say that the Roman Republic lasted until 31 BCE, although a lot of events happened in the hundred years preceding um, the, um, the state. The state is actually the Battle of Actium when the forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra are defeated by the forces of Octavian, better known as the Emperor Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. And uh, the Roman Empire lasts, you could say, until 476 CE, that means Common Era, we also know it as AD, Anno Domini, um, when the Goths enter Rome. So that's a very, very capsule history of ancient Roman history. Um, and the Battle of Actium. Well, you're going to see the Battle of Actium in the movie Cleopatra, um, made in 1963. And, uh, you know, take a good look at this movie because it was the last of its kind. It is a historical epic par excellence, um, with both all the wonderful things about these kinds of movies, absolutely the cast of thousands, elaborate costumes and sets, made to try to look as historically accurate as possible, even if they do occasionally borrow from different time periods. Um, Cleopatra, in her $3,500 real gold red dress, enters Rome with her son by Julius Caesar, Caesarian, at her side. Uh, she enters through a magnificent arch. It's the Arch of Constantine. The Arch of Constantine was actually made around 300 AD. That's about 300 years after Cleopatra entered Rome. But hey, it looks really great. It really does. And uh, Cleopatra also you know, enters Tarsus, where she entices Mark Antony on this magnificent boat. It was a real ship. Um, and um, this movie, um, as you know, you should look up some of the history behind the backstory behind the movie. It was the, really the last of its kind. It almost bankrupted uh, 20th Century Fox Studios. The movie, uh, you know, it was it made took years to make. Um, you know, originally it was conceived around in the late 50s, not shown to 1963. Original cut was over four hours long, kept making it shorter and shorter till it's about three and a half, um, with the result that a lot of scenes, um, many with Richard Burden as Mark Antony, were cut out. Um, the movie has, you know, it, it, um, it shifts a little bit. The first half uh, is about Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, played admirably, I think, by Rex Harrison, who thought that the, you know, the man who played Dr. Doolittle could be a great Julius Caesar, but I think he is. Um, Julius Caesar, of course, is assassinated on the Ides of March, 44 BC. It happens in the movie. Um, the Ides of March are coming up, by the way, um, on our calendar. And um, after that, of course, the, the you know you lose a great actor. <laughs> you have to. It's a historical epic, and um, the movie does change a little bit in its focus. Um, so um, after this, studios did not make these kinds of big budget. Uh, Movies, after all, you know, and of course now in the 21st century, we uh, have the help of computer animation. Um, so you don't have to worry about building the actual ship. You can digitally create the entrance of Cleopatra to Rome. But, you know, I think there really is a difference when you make things for real. And, um, you know, uh, the, I mean, by, you know, the epic story of the making of Cleopatra, you know, you could say it was an example of an epic failure, perhaps. Well, 
we're going to contemplate all this while reading a wonderful, another example of an epic that truly has a place in history that is about historical events, namely Virgil's Aeneid. The Aeneid is the story of Aeneas, a Trojan prince who, from the shores of Troy, has to flee as the city's burning and falling down as the Greeks are invading. And he, it's the story of his journey uh, over land and sea to get to Italy. And um, um, Rom again, Aeneas does not found Rome. That's Romulus's job. But he does, uh, through some clever um, poetic devices, storytelling, he uh, starts the uh, sets in motion the founding of the Roman race. Um, we will be reading um, several books from the Aeneid, not the whole thing. You are more than invited to do so. Um, when I was a classics major, I was often asked the question, which two poems do you like better? Are you a Homer, are you an Iliad person, or an Odyssey person? And, you know, as if, you know, choosing, you know, the story of the, the feats of Achilles in war versus choosing the story of the feats of, of Odysseus trying to get home, the journey of one man. And I guess uh, I was trying to be a little bit cute. I would say, I like the Aeneid. Um, and, um, I still really do. The Aeneid, you could say, it tried, it, it, you know, Virgil was well aware of his poetic predecessor, Homer, who lived 800 years before him. Um, when you're reading Virgil, you will find, uh, you know, references galore to Homer, invoking the muse. Um, of course, you know, Aeneas is the prince whose, uh, family was, you know, killed and defeated by Achilles, by the Greeks, by the wily Odysseus. Book one that you'll be reading is uh, starts in medias race. That term in medias race into the middle of things. This race is actually the same race in race publica. Um, it starts in the middle with Aeneas in a storm. You can say he is not your typical hero. He is actually fearing for his life. Um, Aeneas is going to be shipwrecked. He ends up, uh, he, he's actually sailing from Troy, which is on the coast of uh, modern Turkey. Ends up in northern Africa, in the city of Carthage, uh, where he meets a beautiful, a beautiful Carthaginian queen, Dido, falls in love. Um, book two uh, is all about the story of Aeneas recounting the fall of Troy and how he and his men um, you know, eventually come to where they are in Northern Africa. And uh, Dino and Aeneas fall in love. Cupid helps out a lot. Um, actually, Cupid helps out a lot, but also so does Venus, who just so happens to be Aeneas's mother. Yes, he is the son um, the, of a goddess, goddess of love. And uh, in book four, um, you know, uh, Aeneas looks like he's pretty happy to settle down into Northern Africa with Dido, but the gods call him on to his duty, and he must go on and found Rome. So he leaves heartbroken Dido, um, and Dido responds very, very badly. Notice as you're reading book four what a sympathetic figure Dido is. She is, um, you know, Virgil portrays her like a tragic heroine. Um, she dies, she's given up, you know, her reputation, her city, all the things she's done for Aeneas, for one man. And um, Dido, you know, keep in mind too, she is technically a barbarian queen. She is uh, from, originally from, um, the, from Asia Minor, um, has fled from there, you'll find out why, uh, to found this is the city of Carthage. And keep in mind that for the Roman to hear the name of Carthage at this time would have sent, you know, some kinds of chills at the spine, the feelings of animosity, because um, in the third century, Rome had fought three uh, series of wars called the Punic Wars with the Carthaginians. Punic Wars. Hannibal, for instance, uh, was the uh, Carthaginian king who brought the elephants across the Alps and, uh, you know, got very, very close to the gates of Rome. Um, so the Carthaginians were still uh, very real in Rome memory, even though they had been subdued. And, um, and um, Virgil uh, puts his, uh, you know, the very ancestor of Rome is in enemy territory and has him fall in love with a very, very beautiful and very sympathetic um, barbarian foreign, so you could say, queen.
So keep in mind the portrayal of Dido. Think about all the tragic heroines we've read about. Take a really close look at the similes. Who does Dido get compared to? Um, similes uh, also um, to keep in mind are of um, when Virgil, um, you know, he is writing a poem about supposedly these ancient events that happened really before the 753 BC. Um, you know, legendary events. Um, but Virgil occasionally inserts um, a few references to something that sounds a little bit like modern day Rome, modern day Roman politics. Someone like the figure of an orator, people who would have been important in Roman society. Keep an eye out for that too. The Aeneid is, you know, in a way very different from Homer, is infused with Roman history. And, um, you know, it's um, finding all of this, you know, you need to take a Roman history course too to, to get a really good sense of that. But I think you can get a feel that even though Virgil's writing about what he knows are mythological events, he is, he, he, he's got the sense that, you know, this is the great ancestor of the Romans and we need to get him to Rome. And there sure are a lot of obstacles in the way. And, you know, so great a story was it to found the Roman race. It's an epic story. Um, the opening of the Aeneid is Arma the Runca Cano Troyai, P. P. Misaboris, Italian Fato, Pufugut, Lavinia, Cavenit, Litora, Moti, Letteris, Fatato, Altus, what, etc. Arma the Runca Cano, though, the very opening of the Aeneid. Just want you to keep that in mind as you're reading. Arma the Runca. Cano, the opening of the Aeneid. This means arms as in weapons. This means the man as in Aeneas. Cano is asing, que is and. Aeneid is a story about both of these things. It's a story about arms, kind of like the Iliad, and a story of the man, kind of like the Odyssey. Virgil singing it to you. Um, the first part of the Aeneid you'll see is really more about Verum. It is really more about Aeneas. Um, but both of these things are necessary, shall we say, in an epic, um, in an epic poem.